say uh, hello everyone. My name is Sarah <coughs> and unlike the previous three speakers, um, I am still doing my PhD and so I've not completed my project yet. So there is a slightly less result, certainly less technical, complicated and impressive results in my presentation compared to the previous few, but hopefully it'll still be interesting. So I'll be focusing a bit more on um, how I've been getting on with ELS and the reasons why I chose it and things like that. And um, I'm also uh, doing a linking of two different uh, data sets, uh, which um, you know, might be interesting for some people to, to learn about as well. So uh, just a really quick introduction to myself and my kind of context in which I'm doing this research. So um, my, uh, I'm in the fourth year of my PhD, hoping to finish quite soon. Um, and um, my entire PhD looks at uh, low pay and progression in the UK. So um, you might know that in the UK there are quite a lot of low paid workers um, and um, there's also some evidence that um, mobility out of low paid jobs into slightly higher paid jobs, better jobs, is relatively low in the UK. So I'm interested to find out more about what sort of things influence that progression from low pay um, and particularly when it comes to the kind of local labour market environment that the workers um, are in. And uh, so I'll talk to you a little bit more about you know, the specifics of this um, study that I'm doing at the moment, which is uh, I've, I've looked at um, another aspect to do with local labour markets and progression in the first part of my PhD. I'll talk to you about um, this study uh, here, for which I'm using the LS. Uh, and I'll talk to you about why I, choose to, why I chose to use BLS uh, in combination with the LFS, and then um, some of my experiences of applying for the data using it and so on. Um, this probably will mirror to some extent what you've already heard, but, uh, but anyway, and I'll share some early results uh, as well and tell you a bit about what I'm uh, currently working on and planning to do next. So, oh, this graph hasn't quite, you know, worked out the way that I am. Uh, like, let me see if I can just uh, oh, resize it slightly so you can read. There we go. There we go. Uh, that's better. So um, the kind of general premise of my research is that um, in the UK and also in many other countries over the last couple of decades we've seen this um, sort of hollowing out of the labour market in terms of the uh, proportion of uh, employment in what you could call sort of intermediate or middle wage occupations has slowly declined relative to employment in uh, relatively low paid and uh, relatively high paid occupations. So you can see uh, uh, this is based on our data of just divided um, all occupations into some broad categories. So you've got low paid here uh, on the left, you've got intermediate job, you've got social professional manager and professional and the uh, average wage associated with each of these groups tends to sort of go up as you move further to the right and you can see that from 2001 to 2011 um, there's quite a big relative decline in the employment share in intermediate occupations and this has happened since um, about the 1980s and one of the reasons, uh, one of the main reasons is because the influence on, of computer technology on the workplace. Um, so this tends to affect uh, occupations like sort of administrative secretarial occupations as well as some types of manual occupations where machinery is replaced the a lot of the tasks that workers used to do. Um, and there might be other causes as well, but I'm not so much interested in the causes. Uh, I'm interested more in well, what are some of the implications of this trend. Um, and obviously the trend in itself has been studied quite widely and it's it's interesting just to observe, you know, the sort of changing structure of the labour market. Um, but given my interest in uh, progression and low pay, I wondered, um, well, what does this mean for workers who are in relatively low paid jobs who might be looking to kind of move up the occupational ladder? Um, is the fact that, you know, there now are uh, perhaps relatively fewer intermediate jobs available, potentially, um, does that mean that they you know, are finding it more difficult to achieve that sort of upward occupational ability. And uh, given also my interest in kind of local labour market areas and recognising that uh, different areas of, of the UK are have quite different occupational structures, the way that I thought about uh, investigating this is by sort of exploiting the geographic variation 
in the uh, in this sort of polarizing trend that has happened. So this sort of job polarization of employment in both sort of low and high paid occupations relative to middling occupations has affected different areas of the UK differently. Um, and so you can kind of compare, if you like, uh, occupational mobility from low paid occupations between these different types of areas. So if you live in an area where um, there's still quite a lot of, of these intermediate jobs, does your, is your mobility affected in a positive way compared to if you live in an area where there's, you know, where there's been a, a more of a hollowing out of these, of these intermediate occupations. So um, to investigate this, I needed to find the right data. And um, I, uh, I sort of, in my head, divided it up, I guess, into two main types of data that I needed, I suppose. So I needed to first of all look at occupational mobility, that's kind of my dependent or outcome variable. Um, and then I also needed to have some data on the degree of job polarization at the local level. Uh, so for the first one, the occupational mobility data, obviously I need longitudinal data because you need to observe changes in occupations uh, and it needed to have uh, quite a large sample size um, because I'm looking at a specific group of workers, workers who are initially start off in quite a low paid occupation like, I don't know, being a sales assistant or a cleaner or something like that. Um, and I need, and because there's relatively little occupational mobility, if you just look from one year to the next, you need to look at it over quite a long period of time. Again, this hasn't really formatted very well, has it? Anyway, I'll just talk. Um, so you need to look at it over a relatively long time period, especially workers in low paid occupations. They don't tend to move jobs all that often and occupations even less frequently. Um, I needed to also uh, have um, occupational data, obviously, and preferably occupational data that is consistent over time. So you need to, um, those of you who've worked with occupational data before might know that there's, um, over the years, there's been uh, various different classifications. So they first introduced these standard occupational classifications, I think in like the 1980s or 90s or something, and they've updated it since. So there's um, a, two, there's a 1990 version, there's a 2000 version, and there's a 2001. 2010 version. So as the nature of occupations change, they update you, which is a good thing um, because you need to reflect the occupations that people are actually doing. Um, but it makes things very difficult when you're trying to look at changes over time because you want to observe them according to the same classification system in both the start and the end of your period to see whether they've made a change in occupation. Um, and the last thing is that I needed to know where people live in terms of what their local labor market area was in order then to um, identify whether their local labor market was polarized or not. And then uh, for the, um, I guess, area level data, I needed kind of similar, um, had similar criteria, so also a relatively large sample size because small areas, so you need to have a sufficient number of observations within each area. Obviously it needs to go over the same time span as the, um, as the other data set. Uh, also you need occupational information and also you need to have the uh, information available at the same geographical areas. So why did I choose the LS um, for the occupational um, mobility um, part of the uh, of the research or the sort of data requirements anyway? Uh, well, it kind of meets all of the criteria that I just set out. It has a lot of sample size. Uh, it has, um, because it's collected every 10 years, even if you just use two waves, you already have 10 years worth of you know, observing people's lives. So, you, you know, in that period, quite a lot of people change occupations, which is good. Um, they uh, conveniently have uh, occupations in the same classification system, although it's imputed data for one of the ones, I think. Um, but it allows you to observe that, that mobility that I was talking about. Um, and you have, um, it's like quite uh, relatively small area level uh, geographic variables. Um, I'm using travel to work areas in my case. Uh, which were available in both the 2001 and the 2011 data set, which was great. And then I chose to use the LFS for the other part, the um, local uh, level data about polarization, but also because it meets all the requirements that I set out, um, you know, a relatively large sample size and so on, especially because you can pool data for multiple years. 
Um, and uh, unlike the uh, allies, it also has earnings information, which was important because I wanted to look at the wages associated with occupation in order to kind of um, construct my measure of polarization. And a big plus is that you can access it through the Secure Lab, which I think someone mentioned before. This is the um, online sort of secure uh, system that you can use wherever you are. You just need to get it set up, which does take a long time. Uh, but then you can use it wherever you're having to study your work, which is um, more convenient than traveling to London. So I probably don't have a lot of time left, um, but um, I'll just, uh, you know, sort of reiterate the uh, things that have already been said. Um, obviously, there is an application procedure to access the LS, um, this, so you have to take some time for that. But uh, it didn't take nearly as long as my secure lab application for the LFS, so I just wanted to mention that. It's uh, relatively good. <laughs> and uh, as others have also mentioned, there's uh, quite good uh, documentation about the variables and so on available, which will help you in your application. Um, the Salesforce staff are excellent. Um, so in my application, I had to also um, explain to both the, in both my application for the LS and the LFS, what my plan was to eventually link the two data sets together. Um, and that, I guess, just introduces a slightly extra layer of complexity. But because I was linking at area level, it's, you know, not, um, yeah, it's relatively straightforward to do. Um, but the only slight issue is that although I'm currently doing the analysis of the LFS in Secure Lab at Coventry University, where I study, um, the, uh, they will not allow any data to be exported from the Secure Lab or like cleared or released from the se Secure Lab. So I've had to also apply for a secure research service or SRS application for the LFS to then replicate my analysis there on the LFS. And then, so it's a slightly complicated procedure. So if anybody is thinking of doing this linking of the data, it's worth sort of thinking through in advance how you're going to do that and talk with the um, support staff. They, you know, they'll be able to help you to figure figure out how to do this. So I haven't yet done this, but um, hopefully very soon I'll be able to do the linking. Uh, and um, should I probably stop? Um, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, so, uh, as I've already mentioned and I've already said before, traveling to London is not like ideal. I do know that I can send two files, but in my case, you know, I really needed to kind of be there and look at the data and figure out exactly what variables one needed and how, what did they look like. And um, my coding is not quite as meticulous as. Maths is probably so I have a lot of mistakes. Uh, so uh, at the moment I've been coming in uh, to do my analysis. Uh, I live in Birmingham, so it's not that bad uh, traveling to London, but it obviously just take a bit of time. Uh, but once you're there, the SRS sort of um, environment is quite nice to work in. It's always very quiet, um, so that's um, makes it a good working environment. And plus, the fact that you know you're on PCs that you can't use the internet on is really good for like your discipline because there's no distractions. <laughs> So I'm like super productive when I go, which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, so as others have also mentioned, like the LS is a really great data set. Um, we've got like great range of variables, we've got very low attrition um, compared to, I've previously worked with Understanding Society where you do see higher attrition rates, you know, even from year to year. So it um, makes things a lot easier that like the majority of your sample in one uh, census is still gonna be there the next census. Um, and just really briefly, I just looked at the occupational mobility of um, workers who start in a low paid occupation just to sort of get an idea um, where they ended up 10 years later, um, basically. So this is also only for those who are still in, in employment in 2011. And um, you can see that, like, actually the majority are still um, yeah, just over half are still in a low paid occupation 10 years later. So this goes back to the point that I was saying that there's not all that much occupational mobility. Um, and then um, there's quite a lot of mobility in intermediate occupations, which is the sort of, you know, biggest uh, occupational category that they tend to move into. Um, but when you add these up, like, you, it's still higher than this one. So there's still a relatively large amount of mobility for low paid occupations, too, also, you know, occupations higher end of the sort of skill spectrum and weight spectrum um, as well, which is quite encouraging uh, to see. So, anyone have any questions? Any questions? Uh, 
requirements? Or? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you dealt with self-employed at all, because I'm thinking the LFS doesn't have wage information on the self-employed. Uh, the LFS, no, I'm looking uh, uh, only at people who are in paid employment uh, to so I guess, make things a bit easier. I don't know about the LFS, what information they might have on self-employed earnings. I know that it's obviously not as yeah, good and reliable as any wage data, but they I don't think it does because right. self-employed is so seasonal, so it's difficult to have the consistency of measuring. Uh, yeah, although in the LFS you do observe uh, people um, over multiple waves, so in terms of that, you could maybe do some adjustment if you were interested in it. But I don't have any experience with that, so I'm not really the best person to ask, I'm afraid. So, I was going to say, I'm noticing in the samples that you, you look at uh, men age 16 to 64 and women age 16 to 60, I guess, yeah. uh, in both 2001 and 2011. So, obviously, that you know. Uh, those, anyone who's older in 2001 is going to be pulled out of the sample because yes. of uh, But that also goes to lead into, it might help you be able to differentiate what we call sort of like natural uh, progression. So those people who enter uh, the labour market at young, there will be a natural progression of going from uh, those who intermediate to those who have been directly affected by this process that yeah, no, that's so what I'm saying is sort of like an age specific analysis of like younger workers versus prime age versus older workers. Yeah, exactly. Might Someone who at the start of the period is yeah. already in their forties might not necessarily be expected to move all that much exactly. anymore at that at that stage. Um, although having done some previous work on this like with women and men it's slightly different because yeah. some women after child after having children, they might return to the labour force, and then sometimes they do still have some mobility um, after that, um, especially if maybe they go back to education as well. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that I'll be looking at, and I did um, do a little bit of more finely detailed analysis, you know, different age groups and so on, so you can see differences definitely, and you might also, as you suggest, be able to see those differences in the effect of polarisation as well on the different on the different age groups. So. Um, that's